Ready to roll? Ready to roll. All right. Uh, it is good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Endocrine Grand Rounds. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Hires. Um, Dr. Hires uh, is a product of the University of Florida, Florida College of Medicine. Uh, he graduated there in 2014, I believe. Um, he then went on to a pediatric residency and a pediatric endocrinology fellowship, uh, also at the University of Florida, um, uh, completing uh, his training as a chief fellow in 2019 or 2020. And then he joined us actually uh, as our uh, COVID faculty uh, member in uh, 2020, uh, joining the University of Louisville and Norton Children's um, uh, in 2020. And since that time, uh, he has um, uh, distinguished himself uh, with a number of leadership roles, uh, in addition to um, uh, rising uh, to uh, um, uh, take on a leadership role in Diabetes Camp, um, our Camp Hendon. Uh, he is also co-director of our metabolic bone program, uh, metabolic uh, multidisciplinary metabolic bone clinic, and um, which is very apropos, he is our director of our long-term cancer follow-up program. And so today, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to hear uh, for us to have him speak on this topic: uh, endocrine complications in long-term survivors of childhood cancer. All right, welcome, Dr. Hires. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. So, all right, so today uh, I'm Paul Hires. For those I haven't met before, but I met most of you by now. Um, we, me and Kelly were talking, it's like I've already given three talks and it's been almost three years since I've been here. So, this time's flying by. Um, today I'm gonna talk about endocrine complications and long-term survivors of childhood cancer. So when I was thinking about a, a talk to, uh, to present to you guys today, I was trying to think of uh, something that would bridge the, the overlap between like pediatrics uh, and adult, so, you know, um, children get cancer, and hopefully with our good medical care, they will survive it. Um, I don't think during my fellowship I appreciated, um, I, th I, I remember seeing some of these kids, but I don't think I appreciated all the endocrine complications that could occur to it until I really uh, moved up here. And I think one of my first patients on my first day was a childhood cancer survivor, had a brain tumor, and then hadn't seen endocrine in quite some time, and you start going down the, the pathway, like, okay, let's start checking some of these, you know, pituitary hormones, and lo and behold, they were missing quite a few of them, and we had to replace things. So uh, that's kind of like what started this uh, interest of mine. And so we will start. All right. No conflicts of interest or financial disclosures to announce. If you know of any, let me know. Uh, overview, uh, you want to go in the background a bit. We're going to break this up thinking of kind of disorders of the hypothalamic pituitary access, uh, specific disorders of the thyroid, uh, and then some things that are maybe less, uh, less you would think about in terms of long-term cancer survivors, but a lot of our therapies can have bone effects, and then they can have metabolic effects down the road as well. And I do have a summary slide, so like if you have, like, pay attention to like one slide, this has like the clinical guidelines of like what you should be following, and so it's the it's the table I use in my uh, in my notes to make sure I'm keeping up on everything. So a little bit of background, uh, as we know, like worldwide incidence of cancer is actually increasing. Um, luckily for children, the childhood cancer. Uh, rate is actually quite rare in terms of like the total number of cancers out there. It accounts for about 1% of all total cancers. Um, so it's a minority of the total cancer population, but they uh, have specific needs that are different than some adults that have cancer because they are going to survive. And if they are going to survive, they're going to have a long life ahead of them. And so this is where some of the complications come into play. Uh, Luckily, too, with improving therapies and protocols, now the five-year-old five-year survival for ALL is greater than eighty percent. So, most of our pediatric population with cancer are going to survive their cancer. Um, it was estimated in twenty twenty there's approximately half a million childhood cancer survivors in the U.S. currently, and so that number is only going to continue to grow. Why is this important? About fifty percent of the childhood cancer survivors are going to develop at least one endocrinopathy in their life. And so it's, it's gonna be a large number 
uh, and a pretty high amount of people that need to be seen by pediatric endocrinologists and then adult endocrinologists as well. Um, risk factors for this, we'll go into more detail about this, but radiation is like is the major one. Uh, our endocrine organs are exquisitely sensitive to radiation. Um, and with the radiation, it's dose dependent and also time dependent. So the larger the dose, the more likely you're gonna have a deficit, but given enough time. And so five years, you may or may not have something, but give it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You know, if you have cancer at the age of, you know, 10, you know, you're gonna live hopefully another 60, 70, 80 years, uh, you're gonna develop an endocrinopathy. Uh, chemotherapy, uh, also um, can cause uh, certain deficits. Um, stem cell transplant has specific considerations as well. And then obviously, if, depending on the type of cancer they have, surgery, if it is involving the hypothalamic pituitary region and you take out the cancer, but you take the pituitary with it, you're gonna have kind of more immediate needs. Um, this talk is more focused on kind of the long-term stuff, radiation, chemotherapy, um, the surgery, we kind of all understand that, like, it's a more immediate effect, whereas these other ones happen over time. Um, and then this underscores the importance of why these people need lifelong monitoring is because it can occur decades after their treatment is complete. So specifically about radiation, um, radiation uh, damage is multifactorial. DNA damage leads to cell death and oxidative stress. It also has an unfortunate side effect of uh, increasing the risk for secondary malignancy as well. Um, different than adults, children are more susceptible to radiation because their endocrine organs are growing, their bones are growing, and they also have a much longer post-exposure life expectancy than some adults that have cancer. Um, exposure to the hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, and gonads is the single greatest risk factor. Um, these are the organs that are just exquisitely uh, sensitive to radiation. And so uh, even with what seems like minimal radiation, I don't know if that's actual like a definitive thing. I don't think there's such thing as minimal radiation, but um, it can cause significant damage and lead to endocrinopathy. And then like we talked about a little earlier, dose and time are the biggest risk factors. Um, there is some evidence depending on the type of uh, therapy you get, there are some age and sex differences as well, but they seem to be minor. Uh, the, the SI unit that we use uh, to measure uh, the amount of radiation exposure is gray. It's named after a British physicist. Um, that was important uh, in um, X-ray and uh, radiation research. Um, the actual like measure, it's defined as the absorption of one joule of energy for, of ionizing radiation for one kilogram of matter. And so when we're talking about radiation exposure, like the one kilogram of matter is human tissue. Um, the kind of the numbers to kind of roughly keep in the back of your mind, um, 12 to 18 gray can cause growth hormone deficiency in central precocious puberty. Uh, and these are the more common endocrinopathies that you're gonna see. Um, and then doses greater than 30 gray can kind of wipe out everything. And so if you're 12 to 18, growth hormone deficiency, central precocious puberty, greater than 30 can kind of hit everything. Um, and then that's just kind of the, how the endocrine functions, but there's as little as a 0 0.15 gray can actually decrease fertility in males too. So there's kind of a, a scale as well. It can cause some like subfertility as well. Chemotherapy, um, you know, it causes DNA damage, oxidative stress, uh, reduces blood flow. Um, chemotherapy induced damage is determined by several factors, uh, including the rate of cell division, what the targeted biosynthetic pathway is, uh, as well as the uh, pharmacologic distribution. It rarely causes hypothalamic pituitary access problems, but there are the newer targeted uh, chemotherapies that are like the monoclonal antibodies. There is some. Uh, uh, evidence that it can cause hypophysitis as well, um, just because of their mechanism of action. Um, when we think about chemotherapy, what you wanna mainly think about is uh, gonadotoxicity. And so this is the, the leading cause of gonadal failure and the most common thing we see with chemotherapy. 
Um, the agents I have listed, these are the ones that you want to think of with uh, gonadotoxicity. toxicity. So your alkylating agents, the nitrosylureas, and the platinum-based agents. Um, in the pediatric realm, we see a lot of the like cyclophosphamide and then cisplatin for a lot of our uh, childhood cancer therapies. Um, interestingly, uh, methotrexate is used as well in certain types of cancer, and it can have metabolic effect on the bone. Surgery, we're not going to talk much about it, but it's all about location, where it, uh, where it is. If it's in the region of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary access, it's going to cause problems. You should know about it pretty soon after they do the surgery. Um, and then, um, you know, basically what I remember, everybody needs to remember about surgery. If it's in that area, you got to think about the triphasic response and diabetes insipidus. Um, interestingly, uh, this is all I'm going to talk about or mention diabetes insipidus. Radiation, it does, it, there's case reports of it causing diabetes insipidus, but it's not a, a common thing, uh, interestingly. So the anterior pituitary seems to be more affected to radiation than the posterior pituitary. Um, and so just an overview of kind of what we're going to talk about. So uh, we have our different systems. We're going to talk about growth. The complications we're thinking about is growth hormone deficiency, but they can also, radiation can induce skeletal dysplasia. And so this is generally seen with spinal radiation. So depending on the type of uh, tumor they have, kids that receive spinal radiation, the, the growth in the spine is not going to be normal afterwards. And so they might not, act, they can also be growth hormone deficient, but they might not be growth hormone deficient, but you're going to kind of cause dis, disproportionate growth because the spinal column cannot grow, but they're long bones can grow. And so you kind of uh, can get a little bit of uh, a skeletal dysplasia that way. Um, or if they are growth hormone deficient and also have some spinal radiation, you can make the long bones grow, but you still can't make the, the spinal column grow. And so you kind of like can make them look more disproportionate with your therapy. Um, puberty, interestingly, you can cause precocious puberty. You can also cause hypogonadotropic hypogonadism as well. And it, seems to be slightly individualistic, but also dependent on the dose of the radiation. Um, as we know, the gonads are sensitive to this, so you can uh, lead to uh, gonadal dysfunction or gonadal failure. Um, typically, if there's direct uh, radiation to the area or our alkylating agents we were talking about. Adrenals leading to ACTH deficiency. Um, Again, if they got uh, cranial radiation, also um, a lot of different therapies include steroids as part of the treatment, and so they can have like a partial ACTH deficiency or partial adrenal insufficiency for a time after their uh, glucocorticoids are, are stopped. Um, thyroid is very sensitive to, uh, to radiation and can cause lots of different issues. So you can have, if you get uh, radiotherapy to the hypothalamic pituitary area, you'll have central uh, um, hypothyroidism, if the radiation is more towards the thyroid gland itself, it can induce hypothyroidism uh, or, hyperthy or, or hyperthyroidism. Um, the uh, uh, stem cell transplant has been associated with inducing autoimmune disease, which can be hypo or hyperthyroidism. Um, and then the thyroid is also susceptible for secondary malignancy from the radiation as well. So we'll go over thyroid quite a bit. Um, bone metabolism, uh, osteoporosis is seen in a lot of patients uh, following uh, radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, and then also if they receive methotrexate or glucocorticoids, those can exacerbate the problems as well. Um, and then there's a higher rate of obesity and diabetes in uh, childhood cancer survivors as well. And then... Just a, we love and we know this by heart, the anterior pituitary, uh, all its uh, functions, its gloriness. Uh, and so we'll talk about kind of each of these systems as we go through. All right, so starting with impaired linear growth. Uh, adult short statures reported about 9% of patients with uh, acute lymphocytic uh, leukemia, which is one of the most common uh, childhood cancers uh, that we have. It's much higher in uh, brain tumor survivors, so they uh, have short stature about 40% uh, of survivors. Um, 
there can be endocrine and non-endocrine causes for this impaired linear growth. And so if you have growth hormone deficiency, central precocious puberty, hypothyroidism, that's all going to affect your growth. But uh, growth plate damage to the ra uh, radiotherapy uh, can impair growth as well. But there's tons of other risk factors as well, uh, depending on when their age, when they are treated, um, if they had uh, altered puberty, whether it just might be not clinically precocious, but it's just earlier than it otherwise been. It can, uh, you can read a different height than you otherwise would. It can have an altered tempo to puberty. Um, a lot of these kids have nutritional problems with like anorexia, cachexia as well. And so that effect on growth cannot be uh, undervalued. Um, specifically, there's uh, some other specific therapies that are sometimes used as well. So um, cisretinoic acid is known to advance bone age. And so if they receive this, it could kind of limit their, uh, whatever their adult height would have otherwise been. What we think about uh, a lot though is growth hormone deficiency. So causes, so it can be a direct insult to the pituitary gland as well. And so these are specific tumors such as a craniopharyngioma, germinomas, or optic pathway gliomas that you, we see with uh, people with neurofibromatosis. Um, and so if they're in the way, they're going to be causing uh, growth hormone deficiency. Most common thing we're going to see with radiation, um, the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is, uh, is more sensitive than the pituitary actually from uh, to radiation. I'm not sure how they understand that. Uh, but it's also time and dose dependent. Uh, one study showed that there's a 93% incidence of growth hormone deficiency after four years in one study, so quite high. Um, the median mm -hmm. dose in that study was 44 gray, uh, yeah. so quite a, a good dose. Um, and then dose is kind of in that mild range, 18 to 24 gray. It can take greater than 10 years to develop, so it can be quite a while. Uh, typically, if you have growth hormone deficiency, uh, it's going to be permanent. Um, chemotherapy, there's been reported uh, as the incidence to cause that growth hormone deficiency, uh, but it's not the mechanism is not as well understood. Yeah. Presentation of growth hormone deficiency, you know, similar to like what you would see uh, in our clinic and then as you would see as adults, uh, for the children, you're thinking like decreased linear growth, uh, decreased lean body mass, increased fat mass, truncal obesity. I think somebody's unmuted. If someone, yeah. if you make sure you're uh, um, muted, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, truncal obesity. He said, "Tell me more." He said, "Tell us the minute." Why are you bringing that? Me, Jack, and guys, don't be. I don't know. I'm not gonna do it. I don't know if I can unmute them. Let's see. Oh, they're good now. Assessment for uh, our children. We are obviously looking at the growth charts, pubertal uh, staging, um, IGF levels will be helpful, as well as like growth hormone stimulation testing. Uh, for the diagnosis, though, you, it's uh, the data shows that you can't rely solely on IGFs alone. Um, even though the IGF levels may be normal, there's the radiation will induce kind of an altered pattern of secretion of uh, growth hormone, and so you might be kind of falsely seeing normal IGF levels, but they truly are growth hormone deficient. Uh, a couple interesting things: so uh, you don't want to usually for our growth hormone stem testing. Uh, uh, GHRH uh, is uh, one of the potential um, agents that we use. Uh, with kids that have either hypothalamic or pituitary damage, you won't necessarily want to use GHRH because it would lead to a, a false negative. So they could respond to the GHRH because they don't make it. So now that you actually give it to them, they would pass the test when they actually wouldn't in real life. Other things that we know can cause false positives, sometimes like obesity. If they have concurrent sex steroid deficiency, uh, that can lead to a false positive. And if they're hypothyroid, uh, they can lead to false positives as well. Um, in kids, we generally use a cutoff for our growth hormone level of like five to 10. You know, adults use different cutoffs. Treatment, so uh, growth hormone treatment is recommended if growth hormone deficiency is confirmed. Uh, Mainly at a convention, not based on a lot of data, we generally wait about a year after you're disease-free or you complete therapy before we start it. Um, 
um, in chronically stable disease, this gets a little interesting. So optic pathway gliomas usually are not removed. They're kind of there to stay with you for a bit. Um, and so it's unclear whether they, they have growth hormone deficiency, but it's unclear whether we should give them growth hormone disease or not. So it's a, a team-based approach. We talk to the, the family, the hemog providers, us, and decide what's in the, the best case for the child. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, those with spinal radiation may benefit less from growth hormone therapy. Um, your legs will grow, which is where you get a lot of your height from, but the spine will not and can cause disproportionate growth. Um, depending on the type of cancer you have, so like if it's radiation, we tend to wait till you're a year out. If it's, say, like a craniopharyngioma, and they usually do take that out, uh, we start therapy right away. So we don't tend to wait on those. Uh, there is some uh, association where it may increase the risk for metabolic disease or SCIFI with the introduction of growth hormone. Um, and so it's something we talk about with families, but generally not something we, uh, um, is not a discouraging thing for us to not start treatment. And then SCIFI is the slip cap uh, capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, so probably not something you guys see in the adult <laughs> world too much. Um, why is there like a little bit of concern with growth hormone disease and cancer? Well, like in vitro, you know, growth hormone and IGF-1 is like pro-cancer. So like uh, cancer uses those hormones and can help them grow. It's growth hormone. Um, currently, there's some old data that says there may be an increased risk for secondary malignancy with the use of growth hormone. Some newer studies and current meta-analysis show there's no significant uh, difference in the occurrence of secondary tumors. Um, in those treated with or without growth hormone. And so we feel pretty confident right now that um, if they uh, are a year out, we can start growth hormone safely without increasing risk for any secondary malignancy. This gets a little tricky with pro-cancer genetic phenotypes. And so like if they have um, like an F1 where they're kind of can't have, the optic gliomas is still there, it's a little unclear like what to do with them. Moving on to the kind of the second most common uh, endocrinopathy we see in our uh, cancer survivors is central precocious puberty. Uh, so definition for us is onset of puberty before the age of eight in girls and nine in boys. It's due to premature activation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Um, also seen in hypothalamic tumors and NF1 as well. Uh, in those populations, uh, central precocious puberty can be uh, how we identify them sometimes, but they have a quite high uh, prevalence of central precocious puberty. Uh, in childhood uh, cancer survivors, the prevalence is 12 to 15 percent, so pretty significant. Uh, dose, the you know, again, it's dose dependent. So the bigger the dose and the longer your wait, um, this can happen. Assessment for us is similar. Uh, you're following the linear growth. Uh, this can be a little tricky, though. So, like, if they have concurrent growth hormone deficiency, you may not see the growth spurt as you would normally see it. And so they might just look like they're growing normally um, if they have growth hormone deficiency as well, but they're getting a little bit of height gain from the central precocious puberty. Uh, puberty exam is helpful, uh, but also uh, is a little bit different than what we generally think. Your testes may be smaller than expected if they receive some type of chemotherapy that would damage the gonads, and so they might not be as readily relied on. Um, bone age should be advanced. A pelvic ultrasound in females would be helpful to see if there's any changes. And then we would get an AM, F, uh, LH, and FSH, or an estradiol of female and testosterone of male to see if these levels are, are elevated. And then we would treat them the same as we would non-cancer patients. If we see them, we generally uh, use GNR, uh, GnRH agonist, Lupron, to, to block uh, puberty until it's an appropriate time to have puberty. The flip side, so they can also have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So you would see this on the labs with uh, insufficient LH or FSH secretion, generally associated with cranial radiation greater than 30. So if you had to kind of guesstimate between the two. The more radiation you get, more likely going to be hypogonadotropic. Uh, if it's kind of a, a medium dose of the radiation, it seems to induce central precocious puberty. Um, we define it absent of signs of puberty after age 13 in girls and 14 in boys. Uh, if this happens 
older, when they kind of started some puberty, you can present with interrupted puberty uh, or in adults with amenorrhea uh, or symptoms of low testosterone. Um, prevalence, about 10% in childhood cancer survivors. Um, if untreated, it increases risk for cardiovascular and bone health outcomes, so we know how important uh, either testosterone or estrogen is on cardiovascular health, but also muscle health, bone health, um, and so it's something to pay attention to. Assessment, just like what we normally do, following linear growth, a pubertal exam, bone age, pelvic, LH, FSH. Um, and then we would treat them the same if they uh, are found to have uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and they have not gone through puberty yet. We kind of have a standard way we get them through puberty. We either start with low dose estrogen or testosterone and every three to six months we go up slowly. So we're just trying to mimic puberty. If they had some puberty on their own, um, you kind of would start maybe in the middle. You kind of have to, those ones are, you kind of are guessing where, how far they got into puberty. Because uh, you don't need to start at the beginning if they are halfway through. Um, and then in kids, we typically start with testosterone. We'll do like uh, IM or sub Q testosterone. Um, and then as adults, once they reach an adult dose, we'll use um, the transdermal testosterone or the gel. Um, and then with the girls, we'll use, they have like estrogen patches that we usually start with in the um, kids that have not started puberty yet. Hyperprolactinemia um, also can occur. Main risk, risk factor is cranial radiation. The bigger the dose, the more likely it is, is to occur. Uh, remembering back to our anterior pituitary, so most of our uh, anterior pituitary hormones are uh, under positive feedback from the hypothalamus, whereas prolactin is the opposite. It's always being uh, negatively um, repressed due to dopamine, and so if there's a lot of hypothalamic damage, this will lead to uh, uh, elevated levels of prolactin. And then if you have high prolactin levels, you get the, the symptoms you expect to see that we've all seen, uh, galactorrhea, amenorrhea. Um, on the opposite side, if you have a lot of damage to the pituitary, you can have prolactin deficiency. And so you may measure a prolactin level and it's quite low because there can't be made. More. Um, typically the recommendations is the screen if symptomatic and then you would treat them as you normally would. Central hypothyroidism, again, we know this. Uh, low to low normal free T4 levels or, and low and inappropriately normal TSHs. Prevalence, 3 to 15%. Just with hypothyroidism, like the symptoms are always pretty subtle. Um, can be a wide array of different symptoms. Um, radiation exposure, greater, yeah, typically greater than 30 gray. Um, and these, because we're pretty familiar with thyroid, uh, it's recommended we get a TSH and a free T4 annually to kind of pick these uh, people up just because the symptoms can be subtle. You would treat the same with levothyroxine as we normally would. A uh, couple interesting caveats I found when researching this. Um, certain antiepileptics, so certain, depending on the type of cancer you had, a lot of people are put on antiepileptics. Um, can it alter thyroid hormone metabolism and sometimes get falsely low levels of your free T4 due to assay interference. And so that's where a, a free T4 by equilibrium and dialysis may be helpful to mitigate some of those things. Um, I can think of a couple kids right now where they had like some borderline low free T4s and I'm like debating whether to, to start them. Um, and then I would repeat on the free T4 by equilibrium and dialysis and it came back normal and they had they were on AED, so like I'm wondering if that's actually, I didn't make the two and two until I was preparing for this talk. So probably something that commonly happens that I was not even, I didn't know AEDs altered the metabolism. ACTH deficiency, um, the secondary adrenal insufficiency, inadequate cortisol due to inability to secrete ACTH, wide prevalence, it's both one of the, the less common ones that we typically see higher doses of radiation, or obviously if there's um, surgery in the area. A transient deficiency can occur depending on if glucocorticoids were used during the treatment management. You know, if you have a high degree of suspicion based on their symptomatology, you know, you would check an AM cortisol and or ACTH stimulation test to figure this out, and then we would treat them as we normally would. That kind of follows all the hypothalamic pituitary uh, disorders that, that can occur from radiation. 
um, moving on to thyroid. So thyroid, you're at risk for everything with the thyroid. Uh, so you get hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, thyroid neoplasms, and autoimmune disease. Uh, this is just a study they did. The A column is hypothyroidism. The B column is hyperthyroidism. So uh, especially with radiation uh, to the thyroid, you're looking at almost like 40% uh, uh, incidence of this. Um, if you get both, you're kind of at risk for both central and primary hypothyroidism. Um, but not, I've never seen this before, but there's uh, also increased risk for hyperthyroidism due to radiation exposure as well. Um, it's generally seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma when there's like direct uh, radiation to the thyroid bed, and that seems to possibly induce a hyperthyroid state. So for primary hypothyroidism, uh, incidence is 13 to 20%, uh, causes you know, direct radiation uh, induced damage to the thyroid. Uh, certain therapies as well, uh, radio labeled AMH uh, agents are sometimes used that are gonna uh, come after the thyroid. Um, it can also uh, cause autoimmune hypothyroidism as well. And so that's typically seen in uh, stem cell uh, uh, bone marrow transplant patients. Um, the theory as to why it occurs is there seems to be uh, abnormal clones of TMB cells that occur with the stem cell transplant. Uh, and this is like uh, inducing an autoimmune state. Um, but it can cause autoimmune hypo or hyperthyroidism. But the hypothyroidism is much more common. Rare in childhood cancer survivors for the hyper. Uh, thyroidism seen associated with direct radiation and treatment of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. You would treat with methemazole, uh, a beta blocker like you normally would. Thyroid neoplasms can be uh, uh, quite a common thing. So again, related to thyroid radiation, um, but there's a, like an inverse curve. And so at a kind of medium thyroid dose, is more likely to cause thyroid cancer long-term, uh, but at a higher dose, it doesn't. So it has to do with kind of like if you killed the thyroid outright, it's not gonna come back and get you as cancer, but if you kind of just maimed it, uh, you left some thyroid cells around that are just damaged, they're gonna turn into cancer one day. Um, another risk factor, again, treatment before the age of 10. So if you've damaged the thyroid to some extent and they have 30, 40, 50 years to live, it's just more time for cancer cells to, to change. Uh, incidence of 18%. Um, disease characteristics, it can be benign nodules, you can have malignancy. Uh, it typically acts in a non-aggressive manner. The medium latency of uh, diagnosis is typically about 20 years after their initial therapy. Um, there also seems to be, with the radiation, some like RET and PTC gene changes that the the radiation is inducing as to like why the, the cancer occurs. How would you check this? So annual exam, we're all we're gonna feel the necks of our patients this, um, versus annual thyroid ultrasound. Uh, the data is not clear, does not favor one or the other currently. Um, uh, they've looked at this. Um, the problem is sometimes when you're getting uh, thyroid ultrasounds every year, sometimes you pick up things that aren't cancer and it's the balance of, you know, are you doing more harm than good by putting them through multiple FNAs and extra imaging to find nothing, but you still want to find cancer. Um, so that's why the data is neither, neither pro, it's, you got to do something. So exam is what generally we do. And then if you feel something, we'll get a ultrasound to confirm and go from there with the fine needle aspirate if something seems uh, off on the ultrasound. Uh, gonadal failure, gonadal dysfunction. So, uh, you know, it disrupts not just fertility, but it also disrupts sex hormone production as well. Uh, direct radiation to the gonad is the greater potential for damage than chemotherapy alone. But this is where it gets tricky too, because, you know, there are people receiving radiation and chemotherapy at the same time. And so it's kind of, can be a, a double whammy uh, type of effect. Uh, Pre-pubertal exposure is somewhat protective from damage. Um, though they still remain at high risk. So since the um, 
you're not actively uh, in puberty. They're kind of in like a uh, quiescent type state. So they're somewhat protected, but depending on the dose, they can still cause damage as well. Um, one study showed that about uh, if prepubertal, 50% of females began puberty and attained menarche. But if they received their therapy after 10 years of age, ovarian failure was eventually seen at all. So gonadal dysfunction um, hits you from kind of different areas. So if there's cranial radiation, this leads to possibly precocious puberty, delayed puberty, primary, secondary amenorrhea, maybe some subfertility. Uh, if there's localized radiation, um, to the gonads or your ongoing ad toxic chemotherapy can lead to the kind of same problems as well. Presentation, so if they're prepubertal, they're gonna present with delayed or absent uh, signs of puberty or uh, primary amenorrhea. Postpubertal, they'll have arrested puberty, amenorrhea. Adults uh, or teenagers may uh, express to you uh, decreased libido, menopausal symptoms. Late effects from uh, gonadal dysfunction, you can have osteoporosis, uh, cardiovascular heart disease, menopause, infertility. Labs are similar to the ones we talked about with uh, uh, hypogonadism. You would treat the same. Uh, something that we try to do in our pediatric population is before they get treatment, you offer fertility preservation. Depending on the age of the child, this is either feasible or not feasible. If they're five, not feasible. If they're 13, Maybe uh, it gets into a little, uh, little hard to, this is not generally something that insurance pays for. Uh, and so if it's a male, they would need to provide a sample, but then they would have to store that sample for decades to come. And so there's a monthly fee that goes with this. Uh, if they're female, it's usually a little bit harder to get eggs from them. It involves a surgery, anesthesia, there's a fee to collect the eggs, and then there's a fee to store the eggs. And again, insurance does not pay for it. So this is not something that everybody can do, afford. Um, it's just not something that is, uh, with our current healthcare system, is not something that we generally have. But we should offer it as an option to, to all. Uh, moving on to bone density and risk for osteoporosis. So. Uh, reduced uh, bone mineral density is seen quite often in these people. Um, it can be a primary disease and it can be caused like directly by the radiation that's just damaging the bone. Um, also from the chemotherapy we use, glucocorticoids, methotrexate. Um, then there's compounding things. So like if you have a degree of growth hormone deficiency, delayed puberty, your hypothyroid, that can all lead to uh, low bone mass as well. And then a lot of these people we see in the hospital, they're anorexic, they're cachexic. Uh, they're not moving a lot. And so we all have seen uh, what immobilization does to our bone health. And so uh, these people are at very high risk for uh, bone density problems. Um, and then especially for kids, you know, we, we want to reduce like fragility fractures if we can. Interestingly for kids though, uh, which is different than the adult literature, like low bone mineral density that we see on DEXAs does not correlate with fragility fractures in children. And so you can have a normal bone mineral density and still have fragility fractures, and you can have like the worst bone mineral density in the world on DEXA and never fracture. So it just doesn't correlate the same way for us. Uh, for us to make that diagnosis, it's more of the, the history. Are they having fractures? How are they having fractures? If there's a good story behind it, um, then you know, if they you know, got hit by a car and you broke something, okay, that seems feasible. If they're walking down the street, trip, break their femur, they probably have fragility fractures. Um, fractures have been shown to be present in 39% of children during treatment of, a of, a of ALL, uh, which is a surprisingly high number, much higher than I was anticipating. Um, bone mineral density does improve after completion of therapy, but they remain at risk for the rest of their life. Um, especially for our children. So DEXA can be obtained, but they need to be height adjusted. And so uh, for uh, our DEXAs, you know, it's a density is three dimensions, but on the DEXA machine, it's a aerial density. So it's only using two dimensions. A lot of these kids, as we've already talked about, are at risk for short stature. So if they're short, it kind of can underestimate their amount of density. We have a uh, 
a mathematic uh, formula that we use that it's a website and you have to plug in their height, uh, their age, and their current uh, uh, bone marrow density in grams, and it'll give you a calculation of the correct Z score. And so um, if they're quite short, like their Z will be like quite low, but you height adjust it, it can be normal. A newer thing in the literature is vertebral fracture assessment. So some of the DEXA machines can look at this. Otherwise, like a, a plain lateral spine film will help hopefully pick up some spinal compression fractures. Spinal comp compression fractures are seen in bone fragility. And so if you're having spinal compression fractures, um, it's a red flag that you're going to have fractures elsewhere and that you're fragile. Um, the problem with spinal compression fractures is they're typically asymptomatic, though. And so by the time they will tell you that they have back pain, they have had spinal compression fractures for quite a long time. And so you want to catch these early if you can. So the current recommendations are if uh, they're at high risk for bone fragility, you should be getting like a, a spinal, uh, spinal uh, film to look for these spinal compression fractures every one to two years. Um, DEXA uh, general recommendations are is to get a baseline DEXA at diagnosis just to see kind of where you're starting at, and then one at the entry into long-term cancer follow-up. Um, and then you're going to treat other things. So like if they're hypogonadal, you need to like treat them because this can like artificially lower um, their uh, bone mineral density as well. Uh, prevention techniques that we all kind of know about, weight-bearing exercises are key, vitamin D supplementation. Uh, the problem with those is there's no data to show that this actually improves bone mineral density. <laughs> there's something we tell everybody, and we think works, but there's actually no, like, literature that says that it actually helps. Uh, the things that do help, so, like, therapies we're all familiar with, bisphosphonates, Um uh, do improve bone mineral density, uh, but then you know, a lot of the recommendations are we wait till they have a fracture until we consider all these therapies. And so uh, there are clinical trials underway to see kind of like, is there like a prophylactic dose that we could be doing to offset the effects of chemotherapy or steroids um, in childhood cancer survivors? Uh, other possibilities that could improve bone mineral density, so you got like recombinant PTH or uh, uh, Colossin inhibitor, currently no studies in thyroid cancer survivors. And the uh, PTH will be contraindicated because there is an increased risk for like bone malignancy. So we probably would not want to use that one. Um, overweight, obesity, and diabetes. So this is lots of things in society cause overweight and obesity and diabetes. And so um, you have all those risk factors in this population as well as Cranial radiation, total body radiation, glucocorticoids, uh, depending on where they got their radiation, the pancreas is also susceptible to damage from radiation. And so you can have a decreased beta cell mass from that. Um, different uh, medications, uh, chemotherapies can induce cardiomyopathy and heart damage as well. And so that can be part of cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome as well. Also, um, Certain medications and uh, uh, chemotherapies can induce damage on the muscles themselves. And so you have less muscle strength. Um, all this just saying, like, it's multifactorial. It's changing um, your percent of body fat, your visceral fat, your muscle mass, uh, beta cell mass. Um, and then typically a lot of the nutrition in our kids are, is not up to par. And then when they are receiving nutrition, it's usually like simple carbohydrates, fast food, you know, things that taste good. Um, you know, we're all guilty of this. Like, you're feeling bad. Your kid has cancer. You want to give them whatever they want. Um, that's not always the best food for them. Um, and so these are the risk factors for obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension. Um, generally, risk factors for this include the cranial radiation. So also, like, you know, we know how important our hypothalamus is for regulation of appetite. And so if there's some damage going on there, like, it, it changes that. Uh, steroid exposure, growth hormone deficiency, um, thought to kind of the combination of all these things, there's probably some degree of insulin resistance uh, induction as well. Metabolic effects on your lipids, fatty liver disease, 
Uh, in adulthood, uh, there's a twofold risk for type 2 diabetes. Um, like we would do for any of our other obese patients, we're looking at uh, CMP lipid, A1C profiles every year to uh, check for these things. And then treatment would be similar to what we, what we tell all our obese patients. So lifestyle changes, uh, different therapies that help with weight loss. Um, so in summary, you know, childhood cancer survivors have an increased risk for endocrine disease. Um, major risk factors include the radiation. So if there's one thing you're going to pay attention to, you want to like figure out how much gray uh, the radiation uh, that they've received. Our nuclear medicine friends usually do a really good job. Uh, and if you look at one of their old notes, they'll kind of give you how much gray that they've received in their lifetime and to like what region of the body. So it kind of can clue you in to, you know, how, how, what risk am I looking at for this patient? Um, but generally, if they've had any radiation, you're still going to screen them. Um, alkylating agents is the other big offending agent, especially for the gonads. Remember, endocrine disease can evolve over many, many years. And so uh, after they graduate from the pediatric clinic, I'll be sending them your way uh, to continue to follow. Again, as we all know, early identification and treatment can reduce morbidity and mortality. You know, that's why we do what we want to do. And you know, that's why long-term surveillance is needed. And then, yeah, this is the money slide. So, like, if you didn't pay attention for my whole talk, this is, like, you look at this table. Uh, I have the reference for it, too. It kind of goes through, like, what screening you should get, what are the risk factors, when you should get it, what kind of first-line, second-line treatments you can consider, how you would treat them. Um, and so this is, like, a nice way to think about it, and especially when you're in a busy clinic and trying to think of, like, all the things you got to do. Now, for these patients, uh, this is a helpful table that I use to, to zero in on what I need to do that day. So, happy to take any uh, questions. Uh, and then for those at home, uh, here's your event code. Thank you. So one of the biggest things for adults now is the senior. Yeah. <laughs> That's not my sense. No, I think there's like clinical trials going on now currently, but uh, it's not a standard therapy at the moment. Um, they even made like in the there's a mo the most recent review on this I had was a, was from like 2019, and they made a mention of like those checkpoint inhibitors, but there's no data in children and the uh, childhood cancer survivors to to make any knowledge about anything other than like it can induce the hypophysitis, which is Interesting. That seems to be where we're going. Yeah. And then, yeah, in like 20 years, that might become the standard of care in pediatrics. And then, like, my talk is useless because, <laughs> like, no one gets radiation or gets chemotherapy anymore. Like, it's just going to be, like, such tailored medications that just goes directly after the cancer. But then... I know, you're right. It might increase our risk for autoimmune diseases, and we have a different set of follow-up that we need to consider. Just a comment here. I, I'm pleased to hear you uh, talk about the transition of care from pediatric to adult endocrinology with these lifelong problems, some of which have a latency. So the growth hormone deficiency, in fact, uh, may not be prevalent or apparent uh, soon after the growth hormone treatment and may only be tested abnormal many, many years later. So some years ago, there was a pediatric oncology faculty member, uh, and we looked at this as part of a QA project for him, uh, and we found that very few of the children at that time had been uh, referred on uh, for follow-up by adult endocrinologists unless they were quite sick. And I'm very pleased to hear that you have a different approach. Awesome, yeah. It's hard in my like I clinic. They send a lot of them to me, and it's hard to get a good gauge of like, am I seeing like the worst cases? So that like, oh, of course they all have pituitary. But a lot of the kids I see like have some endocrine dysfunction, and so yeah, we need them to send them your way <laughs> eventually. But I think you even need to connect with the pediatric oncologist. I think they don't recognize or are not, you know, they're concerned with other issues. Yeah. And they don't recognize that, you know, growth hormone deficiency may be there when the kid's 20 years old and it's causing metabolic problems and osteoporosis and who knows what else. And 
since the child is otherwise doing relatively okay, they sort of escape any of this follow up. And I, mm -hmm. so they're, I think, a key member of the team in putting together a comprehensive plan. Yeah, I'm hoping that we're going to hopefully partner with our HEMOC colleagues where I can kind of be part of their long term follow up day so that even just you know, being present is helpful. Sometimes they don't have questions or they don't, they don't know what they don't know in terms of some of the endocrine care that they need. And so I can kind of help out and chime in and see a lot of their patients to make sure they're getting the care they need. That's excellent. That was a good question. Uh, do, you, uh, do you do any genomic studies to determine response and long-term complications? Uh, and then talking about zeroing in, how about restricting radiation only to the tumor itself and not surrounding region? Um, for the radiation part, so, you know, um, certain centers do have like proton beams, so it's a little bit more, uh, I guess finesse is the, not the proper word, but it can kind of zero in to have less spread. And so that's the major problem with a lot of radiation is even though you're targeting one specific location, it's more of a shotgun than like a beam where it kind of like will spread. And so the problem is like, if you have a brain tumor and like, yeah, it's not in your hypothalamus, but it's in the ventricle, you're not very that, you're not too far away from the hypothalamus. And so there's always gonna be spread. And so um, there is some, uh, some of the nuclear medicine folks, they have um, models to kind of predict how much, like even though they can say like this much gray is going to this area, and then if they move this far away, like this is how much gray the hypothalamus is receiving, the thyroid is receiving, you can kind of get some prediction there, but like it's still the spread. Even with the proton beam, it is a lot, um, a lot more precise than where it is, but just depends on the type of cancer. Um, so proton beam to like the abdomen is not gonna spread up to the thyroid or the hypothalamus as much as say traditional fractionated radiation would have otherwise. Um, but again, like depending on the location, it still might be close to the gonads. And so there's still that indirect hit that can occur. Um, in terms of genomic studies, I'm not aware of any um, that kind of, uh, you know, this is getting into like the personalized medicine where like certain people respond to different therapies differently. Um, I don't know of any, but I need to probably look up if there is anything in uh, childhood that helps like predict who would respond better to one or the other. Thank you for the question. Yes. So you yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always hard because like it depends on, you know, it, the treatments are always multifactorial too. So like, yes, there's a surgery to take out the primary tumor, but then, you know, you, you can't always get clean margins. And so that's where chemotherapy or radiation is used on top of surgery. And so depending on like what other therapies they may have had, like, yeah, it might have been in like the area of the lower spine, but if they radiated it, that could have caused damage to the spine. So you didn't like get all the growth that he otherwise would have. The radiation is, you know, lower spines close to the gonads. Maybe he's having gonadal dysfunction because of the, the spread of the radiation or he received chemotherapy. That could be part of that too. Um, so it's always hard. Like that we talk in generalities because it's nice to be like, oh yeah, radiation does this, chemotherapy does this. But like a lot of times in these cancer survivors, like they received everything. And then sometimes they had a failure where they had like a secondary occurrence and then they went for bone marrow transplant after their immediate failure. And then usually as part of that, they get conditioned. So they do like total body irradiation to like wipe out the marrow. And so just like it compounds itself as to like, what's it gonna cause, you know, potentially everything, potentially nothing. And it's just, that's like the individualistic piece where it's just, I don't know, humans are weird. Like 
just doesn't make sense sometimes. Like people respond to like you get the lowest dose of radiation, have all the symptoms, get the highest dose, and some people are lucky, I guess, and seem to have minimal symptoms, but um, the risk is still there, so you just got to keep following it. The ones I see generally, it's it's a widespread. Um, it just depends on when they were kind of picked up with their cancer. So um, the general age range, like most people get cancer in that kind of childhood to preteen type age. And so depending on their length of treatment, which is usually like a year to two years, I'm seeing them in their peripuberty to puberty type age range is when I see them. Um, and so that's a critical age because that's where growth is becoming important because they're going back to school and they're shorter than their peers. And so we got to figure out, do they have growth hormone deficiency, uh, any puberty signs going on? Um, and so that's the general age. But I have a lot of uh, other kids that were kind of uh, missed over the years, so they're kind of late adolescent to young adults that I see and do the exam. They're like, you know, two CC testes, never went through puberty. So, like, even though they're adults, uh, near adults, like, we're kind of starting fresh with some of the, the needs that they need, just trying to get them through puberty uh, back to, like, what they need. Uh, not for me because I'm pediatric. <laughs> so after a certain after a certain age, we try to like transition. We in pediatric, twenty one is our general age. Depending we depending, uh, we'll sometimes see them a little bit older than that. Um, but usually twenty one is our kind of like limit of what we see. If they're in college, I'll see them a little bit longer. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, happy to answer any questions you guys have. And uh, you can always email me, too.